Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 114, which reads as follows. Yo cha vasasatang di ve apasang amatang padang ekahang di vitang seyo pasato amatang padang which again is very similar to the verses that we've been looking at. It means better than to live 100 years not seeing the path to the deathless. Uh, better it is to live one day seeing the path to the deathless. So this verse was taught in response to the story of Kisa Gotami. Kisa Gotami was, um, there's some idea that she was a relative of the Buddha, though I'm not sure, because she comes up in an earlier story of when Siddhartha was going forth um, in one of the commentaries, I think. One of the other commentaries. But at any rate, we have um, Kisa means thin, so she was known as Thin Gotami, which apparently is a problem, was a problem at the time. Um, the uh, measure of beauty at the time would have been plumpness and uh, a nice full belly to be able to do the belly dancing. It was a big thing. <coughs> So thin people, thin women were not attractive, probably not thin men either. And so she had trouble getting a husband. Uh, but finally there was some very, very strange thing that allowed her to get a husband. And I'm not really sure how we should interpret the story. It doesn't have anything to do with the story, so I'm not going to go into detail. But something about, um, <laughs> ridiculous, about gold or, I, mean, I, don't, I don't really get it. So I'm not going to try and and uh, relate it. But suffice to say, she she was seen as being um, somehow good luck because uh, she was able to see charcoal as gold or something like that. I don't get it. She finally got a husband, is the point. And um, a big deal for her was, was having a, a, a child. And so she became pregnant. And that this was a really big deal for her. She was very keen to be a mother. And after ten, after ten months of pregnancy, she gave birth to a son. And this was such a joy to her. Well, going through labor was not a chore. She was very keen for this to occur, as I would say most people would be, having carried a child around for ten months, you would grow rather fond and attached to this being that's growing inside of you. And uh, so once it was born, she was uh, very much attached to this son, very much in love with this, with her, her child. And he lived his first year growing up as children do, but at around the time he learned to walk, he contracted a sickness, and because medicine was at a, an unadvanced stage back then, he quickly died. And uh, Suffice to say, Kisa Gotami was devastated because this son of hers was pretty much her whole world. At the same time, she seems to have led a rather sheltered life because she had never seen death before and didn't really understand what death meant. And as a result, she picked up her dead son when they tried to, to burn him, burn his body. She wouldn't let them and she picked him up and, and carried him on her hip and uh, went off to find a doctor, someone to cure her son. Uh, 
And so she went from house to house trying to find someone who would have medicine who could cure her son. There must be a way to bring him back. It was she she she, she had no no concept of of death of how it's how it's final. And uh, so like any mother would do anything to find a cure if there were some way. And everyone turned her away, cursing her and, and ridiculing her and calling her rightfully uh, crazy or, or foolish. But she didn't listen, she wouldn't listen. And she stubbornly refused to accept the, the fact that death is, is a one-way trip. And that in fact what she was carrying around wasn't actually her son, it was just the, the worn-out skin, worn out, like a worn-out snake skin. It was the leftover. Until finally there happened to be a rather wise person who uh, heard her as, asking again and again for medicine and correctly, correctly deduced that this was just a matter of not understanding death and so he knew, he realized she needed someone to explain to her uh, to help her to understand and to, to gently and, and wisely find a way to lead her because people, it's not that people hadn't tried, it seems that uh, people had been trying to to explain to her, you know, death is one way, but she wouldn't listen to them. She was very, very difficult to teach. You know, it, it, it seemed quite impossible to, to get through to her. And so this man said, well, you know, I don't know of any medicine that can heal your child, but I know someone and he knows the cure. And she was elated, ecstatic. She said, who could that be? She said, oh, he, he dwells in, he lives in, uh, he dwells, he lives in, you see, they use very, very archaic language in these stories, so I fall into it. Thou, thee, I use all these words. Uh, in Jeta in, in, in the Jeta's grove, go outside of the city and into the forest, and there's the, you know, the, the forest of Jeta, go there. And that's where this, uh, this doctor is residing. And so she immediately got up, thank you, said thank you, and went off on her way to find this person who could heal her, her son and restore meaning to her life. You know? Because for her, meaning was her whole attention, you know, how, how attached we can become to, to especially people, but to anything, really. And so she went to Jedawana and met with this doctor who, of course, was uh, our beloved teacher and uh, leader, the Buddha. And she asked him, she said, look, I've heard uh, uh, people, t people tell me that you have a way to cure my child. Is this true? Is it, could it be possible that you have some medicine? Uh, and he said, well, I know, yeah, I, I have the cure. And she says, uh, what, what is it? What is the cure? So, said, well, you have to bring to me some mustard seed. And she said, mustard seed, well that's easy, where, where, and is it like special or, or some special mustard seed, it can't be just that, where, where, what sort of mustard seed do you want me to get? He said, well, no, just any old mustard seed will do, but you have to get me the mustard seed from a house where no one has ever died, no son or daughter has ever died. And she said, oh, well, that's fine. I'm going to go and do that right away. And so she wandered around from house to house. But everyone she talked to, they all had mustard seed. It was a common spice in India. It still is. 
But there was no house where no one had died, you see. Everyone was somebody's son or daughter, and everyone's son or daughter every, in every house, somebody's son or daughter, of course, had died. And especially with, with medicine and, and uh, unable to cure very simple sicknesses, death would, would have been a common thing. You know, and they, they would say, most, most people die, you know, just, just from miscarriage alone. Apparently, um, this is a, one, of the, one of the arguments against God, is that uh, a woman's uh, pelvic bone is to, is, uh, of course there's something to do, something about the pelvic region is the wrong size, and it's not really meant for childbirth, or it's that the human head has, got, has grown too big, because childbirth shouldn't really happen. It's not really, where the body isn't really made for childbirth. You know, even though it is kind of made for childbirth, it's, it's a very, very poorly built system. So the head is, t is too big and oftentimes requires a cesarean section uh, or else both the mother and the, and the child could die. So back when they didn't have this, death in childbirth was, was common. No. Uh, and even when born, stillbirth, this was common, miscarriage, common, birth of a child, you know, under, under five years old would have been common with all the sicknesses and children's um, susceptibility to disease. So, death, death is everywhere. Death takes us all. The death. We, we live in the realm of death, the Buddha said, because we're all, it's like we are um, on death row, just waiting for our sentence. Of course, we've come to accept it, and we think of it as natural, but we are a lot like prisoners on death row, just waiting for our turn. And in fact, no one knows when their turn is going to be. We haven't been told when the execution is. We haven't even been told what sort of execution it's going to be could be slow, could be quick, could be torturous, you know. It's not death by lethal injection, not most likely, not for most of us. For many of us it's going to be terribly painful, fearsome. We're like prisoners in a dungeon waiting to be beheaded, or worse. The realm of the deathless is where we live, not to be a total downer. But every house she went to would say this, and so she would have she would have accepted their mustard seed, and she'd have to give it back to them and say, "No, this mustard seed won't do." And from house to house, and sometimes it was fresh in people's minds, and so they would be sad, and um, maybe even cry. And she felt she saw this 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 sadness reflected in other people, and it really opened her eyes. And so this was the way of teaching her without actually having to tell her, without trying to argue with her, was to see that this was a fruitless, a hopeless task. And slowly this, this corpse on her, uh, at her side uh, lost its, its attraction, lost its um, appeal. And she began to see it for what it was, it's just an empty husk. She started to see that death is just really a part of life. It is natural, not, not a good thing, but certainly natural. And so time after time, going to house after house, she eventually lost all of her attachment to this quest. And she looked down at the corpse and she made a, made a decision, went into the forest and dug a grave and buried her child, or placed the child in the forest, maybe probably didn't bury it, and just laid it down in the forest. And then she went to the Buddha and bowed down to him and paid respect, and he said, oh, so did you get the mustard seed? And she said, no, I didn't. In every village, the dead are far greater than the, the living. And the Buddha said, 
indeed it was foolish of you to think that only you have lost, to think that death has only come to you. All beings are subject to death. And he said, the prince of death, like a raging torrent, sweeps away into the sea of ruin all living beings. Still are their longings unfulfilled. And then he again uh, taught a verse that comes in a later chapter, 287. But we'll get to that later, so I'm not going to recite that. And when, as he taught her this, she, she, and based on just this ordeal that he had, she had been through, and, and then the teaching of the Buddha, she was actually able then and there to apply it and to become a sotapanna through his teachings, which is quite remarkable. And as a result, she requested to become a bhikkhuni. And she became a bhikkhuni and fulfilled her duties and practiced meditation. And then the story goes that one day, every, every two weeks they'd have a there's a gathering on the full moon and the empty moon, all the, all the monks gather together. And so if the gathering is done at night, which in some monasteries it is, you have to light a lamp. So they would go and put the oil in the wick and light the lamp. And one day it was her turn to do this. And so she went and she lit the lamp and of course she had been meditating. And so she stood there watching this flame flicker. And she saw the different flames come up from the lamp and some flames would last a while and, and some would flicker out. And she watched this arising and ceasing. And because she was so in tune with this uh, aspect of, of cessation and, and birth, you know, true birth and death of, of every moment, it really hit her that that's really how our lives are. And she said, it's like, our lives are just like these flames. We come into existence and poof, when we're gone, that's it. There's no getting the flame back once it's gone. And the Buddha got, got a sense of this and came to see her as with, with the last story. And that's when he taught her this verse. He said, even as it is with these flames, so also it is with living beings here in the world, some flare up while others flicker out. They, on, they only that have reached Nibbana are no more seen. So our, our lives are like a flame, we burn and then out. And then we come back again and again. If the flame is still lit, if the, the wick is still lit, the flame will come back again and again. It fades out, comes back. So birth and death, birth and death, ses, incessant but when you blow out, when the fire gets blown out, then there's no more flame. And so then he teaches the deathless. And so this is the idea that this verse is um, appropriate because it talks about death. The, the, it's appropriate because the story is all about death. So the key here was this realization of the prevalence and the uh, ubiquitousness of death. That death is everywhere for everyone, that we live in the realm of death. And so the Buddha taught specifically about the deathless. And because Nibbana or freedom or enlightenment, this is the deathless because you never come back. You don't flicker up and die out. There's no more flame and become free. So this is a, how this relates to our practice. This really relates to the ultimate goal. And for many people, it's kind of a foreign concept. I think many people practice meditation without much concept of Nibbana, even without much desire for it, because it goes so contrary to our desires, right? We can, we can see how some things are causing us suffering, and we do wish to be free from suffering. But it's a whole other thing to take it to its extreme, to take it to its, its logical conclusion, though and uh, think about total, complete cessation. The, you know, if I cease, then what's left of all the things that I love and enjoy? So how this relates directly to our practice, it's something that you have to, it's, it's on the horizon, right? but it's the logical outcome. It's not like it's, it's something you fall into. It's something that eventually a person 
comes to. You know, because there is, as long as we have desire for something, we're going to be reborn again and again and again and again. There's no question there. It's just that once you start to look clearly, you know, and it may take lifetimes to do so, but eventually you start to become disenchanted. You see that it's the same thing again and again, and it's not really as pleasant or as comfortable or as happy as we think it's going to be. We just end up wanting more and more and more and just getting disappointed. We have to learn all these lessons about how we can't ever get what we want, and that's really unpleasant. We have to go through many much unpleasantness. So eventually, um, you realize that life after life after life, it's not really all that it's cracked out to be. And I think if we, if we looked at this life as just one in a string of countless lives, we'd come to see that, well, actually, you know, if I have to do this all again, you know, if the learning isn't cumulative, and I'm going to forget all these lessons I've learned and have to start over. It's not really uh, that great of a thing to do again and again. It's quite stressful and unpleasant. But again, as long as we cling, and as long as we desire it, as long as we're happy about being alive, there's no, there's no worry. We're, all, we're still going to die. We're going to die again and again and again. It's only when we become free that we uh, liberate ourselves from death as well. So that's the, the path of the deathless, path to the deathless, is to give up our attachments and our desires. Our attachments to our own life, our attachment to the lives of others, our attachment to becoming in general, to any, to any kind of arising. This is very much what we're into in, in meditation, so it goes in stages. In the beginning, we're only interested in uh, the arising of, of real suffering, you know, like pain and unpleasantness and our own uh, immorality and that kind of thing. Once we do away with that, then it's only a matter of refining it, right? so that eventually we come to see that suffering is really much more refined than that, and it's in everything. And eventually we give up more and more, and we see more and more of our activities are based on greed and anger and delusion and arrogance and conceit and all that. So we give up more and more and more until eventually we're free. We, we give up everything. We let go of everything and then we can fly away and never have to come back. So that's the Dhamma for tonight. It's the teaching on the, the deathless. One more verse. After this we have one more verse that's very, very similar, and then we'll be finished with this chapter. But these are important stories. It's the story, this is a very well-known story of how Kiso Gotami found medicine for her son, dead son. Medicine to help her fix this problem of having a dead son. And she ended up fixing it by learning to let go, by learning to be more flexible, because her son went on his own journey. It's not like uh, she's betraying his memory. She's just denying. She's just accepting reality that he was gone, and her path led elsewhere. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Keep practicing. <laughs>